Well, if you have a Bible or if you want to grab a pew Bible or even open up a Bible app on your phone, I encourage you to go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be in verse 47 starting this morning. And so Matthew 14, Matthew 13, 47. If you haven't been with us, or maybe you have been, you know that we've been walking through Matthew chapter 13. And in this chapter, Jesus talks about these eight parables about what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is like a sower who goes out into the field to sow seed. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like the wheat and the tares. He says that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a mustard seed and to leaven. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure and a costly pearl. Those are the parables we've already walked through in this series. And as we've been unpacking them, the the most important thing that we have, I think, learned in this series is that the kingdom of heaven, most importantly above all else, when we're talking about any of the parables that deal with a sower, points us to a sower that is one who has a message to bring, a teaching that is important of utmost importance. The kingdom of heaven therefore rests solely in the person of Jesus Christ. We cannot have any conversation about the kingdom of heaven without having a conversation about Jesus. And so that has been the foundation from every other parable that we talked about in this series. Jesus is the reason there is even a kingdom of heaven. For he is the king. He is the messenger who had the message that must be brought. Jesus, the beginning of any conversation about the kingdom of heaven. But then he began to describe to us about this kingdom of heaven, how it takes place in a world where there are wheat and there are tares, there are the good and the bad, and at first you can't really tell a difference, and then as they grow up, you will be able to tell more and more and more and more. I think there is no greater example than in the United States where Christianity became almost cultural. In fact, many have described it as cultural Christianity. I think COVID broke a lot of that. In fact, I think that was one of the ways in which God was using a a natural thing to bring about a supernatural reality that as we look into the world, we can actually now begin to see the separation between the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds, the good and the bad. If you're in the church now, it's probably not because you're some nominal cultural Christian. It's because... You're a true citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe the message that the king had to bring, and therefore, you're part of the kingdom. But we also began to say that we also still need to be careful because who are we to judge the difference between the wheat and the tares? Yeah, we might be able to see see it. Yes, it's very clear that fruit helps, but we still have responsibility. We still have something that that we must be cautious of in our own heart, that we don't judge someone as a tear too early. I was telling you how, in fact, the, the, the type of weed that they're specifically talking about in the New Testament is called Darnell, and this this wheat actually, or this weed, looks exactly like wheat. And you cannot tell the difference until the wheat begins to fruit. And it's only after the wheat has fruited can you tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. Otherwise, they look the same until harvest season. Well, the last time I checked, there is but one harvest in the kingdom of God. And so who am I to jump to too quick of conclusions about who is the wheat And who is the tares until the harvest comes? 
Because Jesus says, if you go too soon and try to tear up the tares, try to rip the tares out of the ground, you might risk ripping wheat up with it. That's not my job. My job is to wait for the harvest. And so I bring up this particular parable that we've already discussed again this morning because as we look at our parable this morning, there's a lot of similarities. And so I wanted to start with that place before we start to look at the differences. And so if you will read with me Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. And again, Jesus is speaking, and he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we hear this testimony this morning, this this word that has come from the mouth of Jesus, Lord, I pray that our eyes would be open to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive and to respond. Lord, it is not enough that we just become hearers of the word, but that we also are doers of the word. God, what are you calling us to specifically as we hear this passage this morning? God, we must know. Lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And make much of your name and very little of my own. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the things that we've been doing is we've been taking these passages, and I've kind of been going a little bit deeper. We've been taking some key words out of them and going to other places in Scripture where we find those same kinds of key words. And this time, we're, we're told about a net that is cast into the sea, and this, this net is large, and it's wide, and it's open, and its entire purpose is to catch as much as possible without care for what it catches, and then afterward, they then do the separation. Well, I don't know about you, but when I hear about a net being cast into the sea, There's one primary passage in Scripture that comes to mind first and foremost above all others. And for me, that's when Jesus calls his first disciples. And I'm going to use the passage from Luke chapter 5, but you could have easily turned to Matthew chapter 4 or Mark chapter 2. But here, in Luke chapter 5, we hear this story. And now it happened... That while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing at the edge of the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, and the fishermen, having got out of them, were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we have labored all night and caught nothing, but at your word, I will let down these nets. And when they had done this, They enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, 
for I am a sinful man. For amazement has seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, were also likewise amazed. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I love this this story and this testimony so much. But it also brings so much conviction to my heart. Because I can't tell you how many times I feel like I've heard the word of the Lord to come and follow him. And I was just like, "Mm, now is not a convenient time. It's not a convenient time, Jesus, for me to come and follow you. This project takes precedent. This work takes takes precedent. My career needs to come first. I need to do all these things. I got to get the kids to, to baseball or to ballet or to whatever it might be. Lord, all these things I've got, I can't come follow you at the moment. I know you've got this grand calling in my life, but I'm not quite ready. But Jesus, when he says that the kingdom of heaven is like this dragnet that catches all these fish, my question is, where do you think that net comes from? What is the net that is supposed to catch? Well, he makes it clear. I think in this passage to his calling of the first disciples that the net gets cast by fish that have already been caught. Right? I would qualify that Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John are all fish. We're all just fish in the sea that, that is in this great sea that is the world. And nets are being cast. And fish are being caught. The question, I think, in some regards is, Are you a fish that has been caught by the heart of Jesus to go catch more fish? And if your heart has been caught by the heart of Jesus to go catch more fish, then should you not do it? Should we not be a part of this great calling of the kingdom of heaven to go catch fish, to go catch more fish? people for the kingdom of God to bring them in. But what's more is I think that's even more important is that when Simon Peter and Andrew let down their nets to catch all these fish in the sea, their concern was not what kind of fish they might catch. Their concern was whether or not they were just going to catch any fish. And I think sometimes in the church it can be very easier as followers of Jesus to be so concerned about the kind of fish that we want to catch. We are so concerned about going after the one. Well, I'm going to go catch that fish. And I'm not saying that that's not a very helpful way for us to be evangelistic. Because if we limit it to one person... Like if there's one person that God places on your heart, one person in your family, one neighbor that you want to talk to, that's great. I think that's a wonderful way to be evangelistic. It allows you to create relationship with that person and to speak deeply into their life. There are a lot of churches that let one of their mottos be, who is your one? And I think that's so great. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a one in our heart. But Jesus said, let down your nets. Not to catch one, but to catch many. To catch as many fish as your nets could possibly hold, so much so that they were breaking. And so much so that as you pulled them in, your ship began to sink. Are you so concerned about your things that the fish might do to you that you aren't willing to bring them into the boat? 
because they might sink your ship. I can't tell you how many times in ministry I've had people come up to me and question somebody in the church about something that they were doing or a past that they had, and they're like, well, you need to be careful of that one. Why? Because they might make ministry a little bit messy. They might be a little bit chaotic. Maybe they're irrational. But Jesus didn't give me qualifications for the kind of fish that I'm allowed to go after. He said, just let down your net. And when I think about letting down my net, that means that all who are within my capability of bringing in are all people that I should try to reach. They're all people that I should try to bring into my boat, even if they try to sink it. And here's the thing. That, parent, that story said that they began to sink, not that they did sink. Do we not trust Jesus enough that as we reach out with our nets and bring people into our boats, that though it might seem like it is sinking, he will keep it afloat? I think our church is a great example. Maybe push back against me a little bit if you think I'm wrong, but I feel like when I first got here, First Pres was a little bit of a sinking ship. We, were, we felt like we might have, little, might have been heading toward going underwater a little bit. And my first year here, it felt like, at least for me, I felt like I was struggling. I felt like at some days that I was just taking a pail of water and trying to dump it out the boat as a 55-gallon jug, a uh, uh, trash can of water was pouring in. Like my little, you know, three-gallon pail was not getting water out as fast as I felt like we were taking it in. And yet, here we are, three years later, and I don't think we're sinking sh ship at all. I don't think we're sinking even in the slightest. I think what I see is Jesus doing a miracle within us, and I think it's because we are so willing to cast our net wide. We're not trying to just say we're going after one kind of person because we really want a church full of old white people. <laughs> That's not who we want to be, right? That's not the kind of church we want to be. We want people of all kinds. I am so thankful that Bessem is now a part of our congregation. I'm so thankful that we've had people like Abel and Nicholas come and be a part of our congregation. I'm really thankful that we have families coming from other parts of the world. We, we're, we've got a wide net. All are welcome. All are welcome. Amy and Estime and Ella Keem. Look what the Lord is doing. Even more than that, we've started casting our net, not just in an international sense, but young families are coming to be a part of who, who we are. Like God is doing a lot, and it's, not, and it's because we have a mission statement that is very clear. We're not going after one kind of fish. We're not feeding one kind of people. Our mission statement is to go invite hungry people to be filled with joy in Christ Jesus. All that I need to know is that they're hungry, not what kind of hungry they are. In the same way, when I cast my net into the sea, all I need to know is that I'm going to catch some fish. I don't care what kind of fish I'm going to catch. And I'm a terrible fisherman. I hate fishing. I'm really, really bad at it. I don't have the patience for it. And here, Simon Peter and his uh, co-workers were out there all day. They caught nothing. Jesus comes aboard, and he's like, hey, let's go back out, and let's do this again. And like, we've done this all day. And he's like, let's do it again. And they're like, well, at your word, we're going to do it. I'm just going to believe you because I just heard a message from you that just rocked my world. And if you're telling me to cast my net into the sea, I'm going to try. I want us to be a part of a kingdom where we're actually just trying to cast our net as far and as wide as we can 
and catching whoever we will. Because guess what? It's not my job to judge whoever we catch. As we turn back to our primary passage today in Matthew chapter 13, he tells us that it's at the end of the age the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. It's not my, my place to, to look at the church and be like, well, mm, they're in. These ones are in. I'm not going to point to anybody and say they're out, but I know you're waiting for it. I know you're waiting for it. But it's not my place. It's not my place to look and be like, well, these ones are, these are good fish, and there are those that are bad fish. We've had all kinds of people walk in this church as visitors. They were here once, and maybe that's all that they needed to be, but we showed them love. I can't tell you how many people that have come into our church once just because they felt like they needed to go to church and I had to pray. They just, and I prayed with them. And they didn't come back, but I'm not going to sit here and believe that my net didn't catch them somehow, that our net did not receive them somehow. They might not have been received into this body, but maybe the work of the Lord is so good that even if they get caught in this net for a moment, they might find them, themselves at, in another net, and that's okay. It's okay for people to come in, they get caught by us, and end up somewhere else. And I know Art's probably like, oh, no, 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 no. Austin, we need to keep all our, all our fish. We need to keep all our fish. He's going to come and give our stewardship and finance presentation. But he's like, we got to keep all our fish in our net. I was like, no, I think the kingdom is big enough that we can catch fish that fit really well in our boat and come ashore with us. And there are going to be some fish that just end up in other boats. Very clearly, in that Luke passage, they had to call over James and John in their boat to help bring up the net that, that Simon Peter had cast over. And they didn't fill one boat, they filled both boats. Sometimes churches do the work for other churches. We reap what we have not sown. Amen. Because it was all up to just one single body to go get people for just their body, it'd be really, really hard. And we wouldn't get very far. Especially because statistically speaking, it takes someone hearing the gospel seven times before they finally hear it the first time. Seven times. So they might hear it in our church, go to another church and another one and another one, and then come back in here and stay or hear it the sixth time here and go somewhere else and hear it the seventh time, and then they stay at that church. But we were a part of it. We cast our net. And so all that is to say, how are you casting your net out far enough? Not just going after your one. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, like, you see these, like, television shows, and they're all about catching, like, that one fish, right? Right? I mean, isn't there an entire famous book about catching a giant whale, right? Something about Ishmael and the big white whale, right? Like, there's so many stories about going after the one fish, and that's good. I want you to have your one fish, but I wa don't want you to be so caught up in your one fish that you stop casting your net to catch the many. And that doesn't mean that you're going to have a relationship with every single fish that you catch. Because here's what casting your net means. Casting your net is very similar to what it means to sow seeds. And to sow seeds means that you're speaking about one message. That message is Jesus' message. A message of the kingdom, of the gospel, of the good news. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And if you receive me, Jesus, you have received the Father. And inherit eternal life. Your sins are forgiven. That's Jesus' message. And so when you cast your net, you cast it wide. You just, and, and the way that that happens is Jesus becomes a part of your everyday language. Jesus becomes a part of your everyday language. Maybe that's just offering to somebody, hey, I prayed for you this morning. Hey, I, I just felt like the Lord put you on my heart. How's it going? Calling, texting. When you're out and about, is Jesus a part of your speak? Of the way that you speak to others? The cashiers and the stalkers, not stalkers, but like shelf stalkers. Maybe the stalkers, the stalkers need Jesus too, right? I mean, is, are they, are, is it just a part of your language that when you encounter those people, they would know that you're a follower of Jesus? Because I would bet that the disciples, as they went with Jesus and then were sent out two by two, people knew who they followed, People knew that they were followers of, of Jesus. They didn't let any conversation slip by without at least the name of Jesus coming out once. At least once. And that's not to say that you're in the middle of a conversation with Jesus and you just keep talking and you're Jesus. And, but no, like how is he like effectually coming out of your lips to someone else? Cast your net wide. Because at the end of the age, there will be a separation. And I think this is where I want to kind of hinge because we didn't really talk about it in the wheat and the tares. But there is a day coming where the separation will happen. In fact, we just last year did all of Revelation. And in Revelation... We know what comes at the end. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, el are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then came the great white throne, and him who sits upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And y'all know me, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. I don't like to talk about hell, but hell is a reality. And I'm not going to be the preacher that sits here and says that you're going to hell unless you get straight. What I'm saying is, there are people that are going to hell, and part of that is happening because we aren't doing our job as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We aren't casting our net as wide as we can to catch as many fish as we can to let them know of the gospel of Jesus all that we can so that at the end of the age, we won't have this moment where we can say that it was our fault. Because we were too concerned about the who instead of the what. Cast your nets, my friends. Cast them wide. Cast them to all walks of life. Let people know, because the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is cast into the sea. And the kingdom of heaven is made up of those who cast nets into the sea. And you and I are the net casters with Jesus. We can actually make a difference with him. He wants to do it with us. So let's partner with Christ in this great work in the kingdom.
bringing all we can and not trying to protect ourselves from who we might catch, but welcoming, welcoming them in and seeing what Jesus can do to keep us afloat. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we hear this word this morning, Lord, I pray that I would cast my net wider. I pray that it would go out and that I would catch all kinds of fish. Lord, fish I never even imagined could be possible at catching. But you can do it. You are at work. You are the God of all things are possible. You catch fish as small as the minnow and as big as the whale shark. That would break some boats. And yet somehow you keep them afloat. Work in us, O oh good and gracious God. In this good kingdom work. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.